Hello, good afternoon everyone, hopefully you can hear me okay uh, and welcome to the second session of our Family Enrichment Programme. Um, today, this session I'm going to focus on study skills uh, and my name is Scott Johnson, I am a Principal Teacher of Attainment and Achievement. Just to give you a very quick background uh, into my role, um, I am very much involved in the overseeing of the likes of the monitoring tracking statements that you get home. Um, which tell you all about uh, either you know, if, if it's the pupils who are listening, their progress, or for you, your child's progress uh, across their different subjects. I'm also heavily involved in delivering interventions and, and workshops like these, which focus on study skills, as well as planning and implementing the likes of our study, um, supported study programme, which is, uh, we've already had block one of that, and we're due to have block two of that for our senior phase pupils. What I thought I would do today through this workshop, I had a real think about this workshop and, and the kind of route that I wanted to go with it over the weekend and originally I was thinking about going through the traditional method of, of speaking about um, different techniques, mind mapping, cue cards, um, flow charts, traditional techniques that, that young people would experience in class and that we'd use when they're studying and I'm going to point you in the direction of a strategies for success handbook that we have and that, that we give to our young people and that you can have a look at as well which gives a how-to guide on a lot of these techniques. What I thought would be more impactful would be to kind of think about what the young people are saying in relation to studying and the barriers that they're experiencing and then break that down uh, into the kind of bare bones, the, the concepts behind it. So before I speak about what I'll talk about in, in those topics, I wanted to share with you the common trends that uh, our pupils are, are telling us about when we're asking them about studying and how they feel about studying. Um, and as you can imagine, I'm sure you can relate, I can certain, certainly relate to some of those statements on the screen just now. They feel overwhelmed, there's just so much to think about and, and that's true, they've got so many different subjects, so many different units and topics within those different coursework and exams to think about. So it is true, um, they've got so much to do, they feel like they've got so much to do, they don't know where to start and they just don't know how to study effectively. So within this session I thought I would break down uh, or break it down into three main topics which I feel tackle what the young people have reported there. So that is prioritisation and time, that's the first thing that I'm going to speak about and give some useful strategies that yourself or, or, or the young people can use uh, to help them when they're preparing for assessments or exams or even just um, preparing to do the best that they can across their different subjects. Uh, the four steps to effective studying and then finally the little tweaks, small changes that they can make um, so that they can experience marginal gains that will have you know, a real combined um, impact over time. So the first one then uh, is that concept of, of prioritisation and that concept of time. I'm sure we can all relate to the image there, I certainly can, particularly um, at this time of year, but just feeling a wee bit overwhelmed, having so much to think about, having so much in our heads and not knowing where to start or what to do now versus what to kind of do and schedule later. And I've just got a very quick strategy, um, practical strategy that I think young people can use to help them to start to decipher what are the tasks that they should really be prioritising, what should they be doing first versus what could they leave till later. So hopefully you can see on the screen the uh, Eisenhower matrix and it's just a very, uh, like I said, simple and practical technique that involves breaking to-do list tasks up into four quadrants. Um, and this could be noted down on a scrap piece of paper, it could be done you know, at any point very, very quickly or you could use the template that's shown on the screen and I'll show you where you can download um, a readily available template where you can just print it and just write straight onto that. But essentially the idea behind this is that we want to think about tasks in relation to being either important or not important and urgent and not urgent. So you'll see there that we've got our first quadrant or to do or do first tasks and these are the things that um, are important and urgent. So the things that are very much related um, to something that could be due the following day, maybe a, an assessment, or anything that's 
obviously very important and related to a young person's well-being. So in there, an example of some of the tasks that they might be writing down would be I need to prepare for an assessment, um, maybe a dentist appointment, making sure that they are exercising and keeping themselves healthy and fit, um, daily walks, and then you know, looking after um, maybe family or, or, or in that instance their pets. And these are obviously the things on our to-do list that we we'll want to try and tackle first. We then move on to quadrant two, and if they were to note down some of um, the to-do list tasks, these are the things that maybe have a due date for maybe a week or a couple of weeks down the line. The things that we want to try and schedule, things like starting coursework that's due in a couple of weeks, starting personal statements that are maybe due in February, and a lot of our young people are going through that, particularly in our senior phase at the moment. Um, or you know, seeing a friend for their birthday, something that obviously is important, but if that birthday was in a couple of weeks' time, again, it's something that they could then you know, plan uh, and schedule their time for. Quadrant three and then quadrant four are the ones that we maybe want to try and question or minimise or cut out completely. Um, so, examples in our quadrant three, um, things that are not important, but the young people might feel at that moment in time when they're noting them down that they're urgent. Again, like I said, we want to try and question these. So chat to a friend about your current favourite series. Is that something that you need to do you know, at this moment in time? Go out for a last minute um, or go out last minute with your friends because they've just texted. Again, can we question, could we do these at a later time and make sure that we're ticking off our quadrant one and quadrant two tasks first. And then finally, our quadrant four tasks don't really need to do. We want to try and minimise these or cut them out if we can. Um, things like spending long hours watching TV, posting on Instagram or social media about the dinner they've just eaten, lots of, of hours of gaming uh, or responding to non-urgent messages straight away. These tend to be kind of coping mechanisms, distraction mechanisms, things that they are using to try and maybe procrastinate. And by no means am I you know, delivering this uh, presentation and saying that you know, I, I never do any of these or that you, the young people should, should never do any of these. But it's just about, again, questioning uh, these tasks and thinking, right, if there is an overload in quadrant one and quadrant two, can we make sure that we try and get to these and either complete or make a start on them before we consider uh, these tasks in the lower quadrants. And I think that, like I said at the very beginning, is a really practical strategy that allows them to prioritise the tasks that they need to try and complete. And when we do look at those tasks, particularly in the quadrant four there, if they have managed to complete a lot of these tasks, the important and urgent, um, and, and particularly those important tasks, then they will feel um, a sense of achievement and it will be more rewarding when they are um, we're doing some of these things that they maybe enjoy a wee bit more watching TV or, or, or engaging in social media if they have managed to complete a lot of their to-do list tasks that are important to them in relation to their study. I think that takes us, kind of segues very nicely into the conception of time uh, that I certainly uh, have struggled with in the past and I think again going back to what the young people have reported you know, they, they just don't feel like they've got enough time in order to complete the tasks that um, they do or, or, or to be able to recall the information that they need to for the various different subjects. So 168 hours um, in one week um, I had to use my calculator to find that one out but I think when you put it in a, a hard figure it does actually seem like quite a lot and it does start to break down that mi misconception of not having that much time. We work in combination with a company called Live and Learn who are a brilliant company who deliver um, a lot of the messages that I'm going to explain uh, and talk about today throughout the country um, and also abroad. But they showed us this the first uh, for the first time a couple of years ago and it really took me aback and when I looked at that first of all I thought, do you know what, there is actually a lot of time there. And in terms of the, the, the free time that um, young people are even thinking about myself, I have, I, I can fit in a lot um, if I am very clever and if I am um, precise with scheduling my time. So I'm going to show you, or I'm going to break down what is in that image. That is uh, the week broken down into those 168 components. 
for each hour. And then the dark blue represents the time that young people um, traditionally would be sleeping, so six to eight hours worth. The turquoise or lighter blue colour is any transitional time, so time that they might be travelling to school or time that they might spend having their lunch or having their dinner. And then the blocked out um, red area is the time that the young people are in school. And in green is the free time around about this. And again, when I saw that for the first time, I thought, you know what, and, and many young people, uh, many of the pupils have, when they've seen this, have said to us, do you know what, I didn't, when, I, when you break it down like that, it doesn't actually look like we're in school that much. Um, it might feel that way day to day, I, I get that, and, and I certainly feel that way sometimes as well. But when you compare it to the green colour and the free time, there is a lot more of that in comparison to the time that they're actually in school. So again, if they are clever, if they manage their time effectively, then they can um, manage to fit in the studying for the various different subjects that they sit. Again, Live and Learn use this magical 10 hours of studying per week. And this is a, a guide. It's, again, by no means are we saying you must do 10 hours of studying, but particularly for senior phase pupils, 10 hours is a really good guide uh, on the run-up to prelims or... Uh, examinations. So again if we were to look at sorting that time out and showing it in a visual way and we do this with pupils through assemblies and through some, some PSE lessons but if I was to block out 10 hours of study and when we do show this to pupils they actually look at that and think you know what it doesn't look that much when you set it out on a, a template like we have here. Uh, in there you can see that there is two hours set aside for studying on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And then this particular, and this is just an example, they have set aside an hour on a Saturday and a Sunday afternoon. Um, and you can see there that there is still lots of free time there. There's still a full Friday where they didn't have to do any studying and they still have a full Saturday and Sunday afternoon and evening there. And if you imagine that that was 10 hours consistently over an 8, 9, 10 week period, that is going to add up to, to a huge impact uh, on the results that that young person uh, could gain. The next topic that I want to speak about there is our four steps, or the four steps to effective study. And we break these down into understand, condense, memorise and review and like to view this as a cycle uh, that the, the pupils should be following um, you know, within their classes, but obviously when they are studying out with those classes. And I'm going to break down each of those different um, areas into uh, what you can see on the screen, so the different definitions. So understand just how pupils grasp the different topics, the units within their subjects and thinking about them in relation to maybe small pieces of a puzzle and how they all fit together. Condensing then is the next part of that cycle, it's the second step, and it's impossible for pupils to remember everything that they hear from their teachers that they read in their textbooks or in their notes, so it's really important that they break this down into smaller, more manageable chunks through either using maybe coloured notes, mind maps, post-its, and again there's lots of useful um, tips and strategies in the booklet that I'll point you in the direction of at the end. The next stage of our cycle is memorise. The idea here is that we want to try and uh, recall that information so that when we are sitting in an assessment um, or, or in an exam, we can recall that information um, and, and take it from, uh, hopefully, a long-term memory. And then reviewing, um, as it suggests, they are just going back to it and at regular intervals to try and break what we call the forgetting curve that I'll explain uh, in a second or two. Okay. Going back to that last point review and the forgetting curve, um, I'm sure we've all experienced this, I certainly have, when we've, we've been in a lesson or maybe it was a university seminar, maybe it was uh, a meeting at work and we're learning new information and after a certain point in time we just experience a gradual decline in the amount of information that we can recall. And this is what we call the forgetting curve. And we want to try and prevent this. And the easiest way or the best and most effective way to do that is reviewing and going back to that um, information at regular intervals to try and interrupt this slide that you can see here in red after day one. And 
by going through the cycle, the four steps, understand, condense, memorise and review it at the end, we can try and prevent that slide of information and stop it from slipping or sliding out of uh, our memory. What I thought I'd do for the next kind of couple of minutes is just a quick task, just for you to think about different methods that you might use. So I have just included a list there of different methods that you might use when studying. And I just want you to try and either think about yourself, um, maybe as a parent and in your own experience of, of using some of these mind map spider, grind, uh, spider diagrams, rewriting notes, um, mnemonics, for example, and then think about ones that you have used and can you place them into the correct category, either understand, condense, memorise and review. The other way you could do it is you could maybe think about the young person at home and maybe some of the methods that you have seen them using, maybe you've seen them using post-its, flashcards, um, maybe they've taught you or maybe they've taught siblings a particular topic of one of their subjects and again go through the same process of those that um, you have seen them use, can you put them, uh, if I was to ask you, into the correct category or column there, understand, condense, memorise and review. And I'll just do this very quickly. I'll give you a couple of minutes, so maybe at 18.21, uh, and then I'll come back to you. I'll, I'll show you some um, examples of ones that I've put into the correct category, and then I can uh, show you a really useful strategy that young people could use with their class notes. Okay, so I'll just take you back just to remind you of our four steps, just because it's the exact same template, basically, that I've used, and I've just filed some of those methods into each of those. So our top right is our understand, bottom right condense, um, bottom left memorise and top left review. So I skip across, attending classes, asking questions, research and listening and reading, all things that would fall under that category of just trying to understand and piece all of the smaller bits of the puzzle together um, when we're trying to understand particular topics or subjects. Next. We've got a condense, how can we turn those um, or, or any notes that we have or topics into smaller, more manageable chunks. Note taking, mind maps, spider diagrams, bullet points, post-its and flashcards are all really useful and readily used techniques that I'm sure you have seen or experienced um, before. And again, I'll show you our handbook which has kind of detailed how-to guides um, on lots of those techniques there in our condense uh, category. We then get memorised or rehearse or wrote and uh, learn certain uh, pieces of information or lists, making connections, mnemonics, symbols and imagery. Uh, for me, I don't know if it's because I've got a sport and PE background, very much wrote, going over things repeatedly, getting my reps in very much works for me, but for, for other people that, that doesn't work. And again, I think I don't want to be prescriptive and say this is what you need to be or should be doing. We want to provide as many tools, if you like, to the toolbox of studying so that you know, young people can pick what works for them most effectively. Symbols, imagery and mnemonics, um, I did speak about um, previously. A lot of young people really like the, the idea of creating stories in their head, making the links between different types of information. History, for example, um, lots of, of people tell us that for history to try and remember specific dates or speci specific historical figures, they use imagery and they create these stories, unique stories in their head that allows them then to recall that information more effectively. And then finally, um, in our review box, top left, rewriting notes or mind maps, testing yourself, reviewing flashcards, teaching others and applying learning through either writing out essays and past papers. Again, to go back to the forgetting curve, we want to try and interrupt this um, forgetting slide by go back to it at repeated intervals uh, over a course of, of time on the run up to an assessment. I did say that I was going to speak to you about a wee strategy that I think um, you can encourage at home um, and that we share with uh, pupils. This here is just a traditional example of, say, notes that they have taken in class in their jotter. And I think this practical strategy allows them to hit each of those different four steps, understanding, condensing, memorising and reviewing information. So we talk about ups, well, upskilling or taking their notes to the next level. So in the middle, 
if you just imagine it, this is the notes that they have been asked to take in class by their class teacher. We would really encourage them to you know, take their notes to the next level by making use of the margins and either at the bottom of the page creating a summary box or even in the back of the page creating a summary box um, which will allow them to then highlight maybe main ideas if we're looking at the margin on the left hand side, useful vocabulary that they could write in that margin, maybe any questions that they think are related to the notes that they have taken in class. So almost back engineering those notes and thinking about any possible questions that they could be asked in class or by the SQA which relate to that topic in the notes that they had written. And written at home then the summary um, just in a box at the bottom like I said or on the back of that page a brief summary of notes highlighting the main ideas um, that has been have been discussed during that lesson. Okay, and for me, that is a really practical and easy strategy that young people can use, which hits each of those steps. The final topic that I'm going to speak about is marginal gains and, and how we can um, make very small changes which can have a huge impact um, when combined um, over time. Now, again, Live and Learn speak about this as joining the 1% club, which I quite like as well. And again, I think it maybe comes back from, or goes back to my PE background. But essentially, we want to think about the aggregation of marginal gains. So over time, just making small tweaks, um, that could be to the techniques that they're using, to just anything related to their overall maybe health and well-being, that could over time have a huge impact. I think pupils think that it needs to be something that's overnight and improvements need to be uh, really drastic by spending you know, hours upon hours of, of cramming, um, maybe in a couple of nights, the nights before a big assessment or exam. And, and we just feel that's not the case. I think a much more effective way of doing it is making small tweaks, making small changes, being more efficient over time, which will add up, uh, like I said, to a huge impact over time. I don't know if any of you know this man here. Um, he is Dave Brailsford and he, I think he works um, with Ineos just now, but he was previously the director of Team GB Cycling uh, Team and he's very famous for his concept of the 1% club and trying to break something down into really small components and then seeing can we improve each of these small components by just one percent. An idea is that that again adds up to a huge impact when combined over time. So he looked at what was currently in place because the, the Team GB um, at that moment in time when he took over the role weren't doing particularly well. He looked at everything from the tyres they were using to the components of the bike to the, the weights of the bikes and the materials that were used, the equipment and the uh, clothing that they were using to train in and uh, to race in, even down to the massage oil that they were using. And he wanted to make very small changes to make, like I said, each of those areas 1% better. And again, this is a message that we will really push with young people. Can you break down your conditions of study, if you like, or anything related to either study or, or your health and well-being? Can you evaluate your current performance within that area and then can you do something to tweak it to make it 1% better or more? For an example there, usually go to bed after 12 o'clock. Well, can we improve that? Can we tweak that to go to bed at maybe 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock and try to get that 7 to 9 hours of sleep in per night so that we are you know, bright-eyed and we're ready for the classes uh, or whatever um, is in front of us the next day. Water intake. I don't drink enough water during the day. Can I refill my bottle you know, twice throughout that day? I generally don't enjoy um, everyday cardio. Um, okay, so, or sorry, I generally do enjoy everyday cardio. Can you then opt to do a further workout outside of that or on top of that, looking at you know, strength and, and conditioning maybe? Uh, I skip study support. Well, maybe try and attend two sessions uh, per week of the additional support that is on offer, uh, maybe from your teacher if they're running a wee lunchtime club uh, to, to give you some extra help. Organisation of, of schoolwork, sometimes I lose track, make better use of their diary or even uh, electronically through their 
school or their uh, calendar, their phone. Organising of organisation of self, have uh, a time management strategy, but it's inconsistent. So currently, that's the stage that they're at. Could they display a schedule that we'll speak about um, at the end? Just creating a study schedule. Could they display that around their room or on their fridge so that they're seeing it and reminding themselves of that maybe ten hours that we spoke about per week that they should be trying to fit in and when they're trying to fit it in. I have my phone by my side when I'm studying in relation to the time spent on a device. Could they then make an effort to move that phone into another room while studying uh, or even downloading one of the apps that can lock their phone for say 20 minutes, half an hour so that they can fully focus on uh, that particular study session. And then finally, when I study, studying late at night maybe isn't quite working for me. Um, could I target two nights per week to study a wee bit earlier, which might help me you know, to be a wee bit more focused and fully engaged in that study session uh, that I've blocked out a wee bit more effectively. What I'd like to do just to, to kind of come to an end uh, is just speak about a couple of further resources which are available. I've spoke quite a lot about uh, this company Live and Learn who are brilliant. Um, they, they really are um, so engaging when they come in and do workshops with uh, young people and they will be coming in to work with some of our S4, S5 and S6 pupils as well as uh, delivering workshops to every S3 pupil um, prior to their transition exams in April. Um, I'm going to show you their website just now, um, so if you bear with me a wee second, I will share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see what it is that I am sharing, um, which is the Live and Learn website. So hopefully you can see there yeah, what I've, I've shared and it's just a Live and Learn website. So if you type in Live and Learn and um, the portal, so it's called the parent portal and in there you would just type in the code SP2021 to get family access and in there there is videos, um, a lot of which go over the messages that I've shared during this workshop but if you scroll right down to the bottom we have uh, different um, work sheets that you can download the likes of the task that we did at the very beginning, the Eisenhower matrix, the quadrant task, you can download a template for that under uh, my priorities. There is a study timetable, again, that I shared that you can download from that as well as lots of other really um, helpful guides and information on exam stress, on confidence, on marginal gains that we spoke about, uh, resilience and so on. So. Uh, I would very much recommend going out, going onto this website and just checking out what resources they have on offer there and watching some of the videos uh, that they've shared. But anyway, I'm just going to try and share um, Achieve platform, which Miss Carlin has spoken about. So hopefully, again, you can see what is on the screen just now, which is uh, the Achieve website that all young people from S4, S5 and S6 have access to now to, and we will be rolling this out to some of our younger years, particularly um, I think S3, the plan is to get them involved in this uh, as they come towards the end of the year in preparation for National 5 and then uh, higher and advanced higher. But this is a brilliant resource that we have just bought into over the last year and it addresses a lot of the concerns that pupils were uh, expressing in relation to maybe not knowing where to start because this breaks all of this down for them. They can pick a particular subject, uh, in this instance National 5 Biology let's say, and they can self-evaluate their performance across either their topics or their units. Um, so if I show you a, a very quick example, in here I have evaluated through a traffic light system each of the different um, subtopics under cell structure and from that it then will give me a breakdown of the things that I maybe need to focus on more than others because they will be highlighted as my red tasks, my red concepts that you'll see here. It will label my amber concepts and then my green concepts that I'm maybe more confident with. So that gives me a starting point. I might want to then focus on these red concepts because it's the ones that I'm struggling with most. Uh, as well as that, they can assess each of their topics and units uh, through different past paper links. So it will take them directly to 
um, past paper links on each of it again breaks it down into each unit and each topic so here for example we've got questions and activities and past papers if I clicked on that question there it will take me directly to an SQA past paper which asks me a question question 1a specifically on um, animal cells you'll see there as that was the first one that I clicked on so a really useful tool that young people have access to that breaks that down into smaller, more manageable, manageable chunks and gives them an idea of where maybe to start for each of their subjects. And they are getting training through this through PSE or have already, already received this if they're in S4, S5 and S6. Finally, I am going to try and share with you the strategies for success handbook that I've spoken about. So I will upload this to Satchel. You'll be able to download this. It's also available on the website, the school website. But in there, like I said, um, there is lots of tips, strategies on how to use flowcharts and it's broken down into the different steps that we've spoken about today. Understand, condense, memorise and review. There's one there on flashcards, on mind maps. There's more information on um, the forgetting curve and, and getting rid of that. Um, you know, filthy word revision and, and breaking some of the misconceptions with that word revision and some tips on how to review information the likes of the Pomodoro technique, how to space uh, or interleave um, the studies and it gives a wee bit of science and some data behind that just so that uh, you can see where that is coming from. Finally, how to create an effective study environment and then that template that we've spoken about for um, planning our study schedule and finally uh, our helpful exam guide uh, it's much easier if you've got that printed out in front of you rather than breaking your neck to see that but that just gives some information for young people uh, regardless of the year group that they're in they might be an S2 or S3 but it's, it's useful to start thinking about these things what to do before um, during and after um, exams to make sure that they are prepared effectively okay like I said that will be available just to download through Satchel. Finally, just before I do finish up, uh, I do just want to say thank you very much for um, being involved and in, in coming along and attending this workshop online and Mr Rushworth will be emailing out uh, an evaluation form so it would be very much uh, appreciated if you could fill that in. It just gives us a wee bit of feedback as to uh, whether you found it you know, effective and helpful or not or thinking about you know, further down the line anything that we could um, you know, add to or, or that you would like included if we were to do uh, sessions in, the, in another session in the near future.